Hello, viewers. Today, we have got Dr. Anu Dalal, who has been to several institutions in India and US and is currently working as a science policy researcher at the Indian National Science Academy. Welcome, Anu. First of all, Thank I would you, like sir. to tell you, I would like you to tell our viewers, what is science policy research? How many institutes in India are working and what is your specific role you are doing? Okay, so, uh, so before answering that question, let me give my brief introduction. I was completely a, a academic person, like a researcher in uh, biomedical sciences. So I have not rigorously been trained as a science uh, policy associate. So when I was in NIH, there were several trainings and workshop which we which we were introduced to, and there I got I got in introduced to a science policy. What is science policy? And a brief course, I just took it out of my interest. So when I came back to India. Uh, I saw this position, I thought, let's try some out of the bench roles. Like I have been over 10 years, I was working on bench, totally involved in synthesizing small molecules and moving to some computational studies. So uh, when I joined INSA, uh, there was new center called Center for Science Policy Technology. So it is a new center, it is a small team, and we have just started up. So some of like, so before uh, telling you what was my exact role. So uh, initially I was given small role like writing reports. It is all reading and writing, basically. It is not, you know, carrying out some rigorous research. Like, as I told you, I was a chemist by training. So uh, one of the recent project was of like, can we uh, apply wastewater surveillance in India to monitor public health? So since I told you my background was biomedical sciences. So this was one of the project I was involved in. So, and there were a lot of case studies which were in West, like they have used this wastewater surveillance in US and in Europe. Uh, and it, there was very small pilot project being carried out in Pune. So our job was, can some policy be designed based on like, can, we uh, apply this wastewater surveillance so that a vector alarm, early warning system can be triggered on. So these are all like this is one of the project. Other were like based on AI and I was not very much into AI, but there were team and I was involved in some projects. So there were different era, um, like fields which we work on. And um, as and as you said that are there many institutes, you know that, you know, that uh, DST has uh, policy centers. Mm -hmm. and when I was getting trained as a PhD fellow, there were not much of like, I haven't heard of science policy, to be very honest. If I could have, I could have pursued that also because it is very interesting. And IIT Delhi has also opened its uh, School of Public Policy. So there are, and GNU has its policy school. So there are some centers which like if people are interested, they can pursue their master's and PhD program. And then uh, IIC Bangalore also offers postdoc fellowship in this uh, science policy. So very few, like in India, it is a booming field. It is not very mainstream field as in West because I have heard that in US, I have seen people like directly from PhD, they work with Capitol Hill uh, people and um, so it is uh, not very channelized, but I have seen that it is taking up in India. Thank you, Anu. Uh, viewer science policy, basically, if I could define in my own words, is preparing ourselves to the challenges and to take India forward in any given directions. So it could be related to energy, it could be related to health, it could be related to infrastructure. Any field you name, we could have a policy how new technological interventions be uh, thought of and implemented. That's the job of uh, policy. And as Dr. Anu just mentioned, it's a relatively newer field in India. Last 10 years, there have been a lot of awakening and few institutions have already come up, who are, which are offering master and doctoral program. And uh, IAC is also offering PDF in that. So it's a booming field. Uh, Dr. Anu, before uh, being to science policy, you have been to yes. some of the lead Indian and American institutions. 
can you please tell us about your academic journey and also uh, if briefly you could say what was the USP of those institutions? Sure, sir. Like, as you mentioned, I started with my a bachelor's degree in Hansaraj College, Delhi University. Then I moved to IIT Roorkee for master's. Then for my PhD, I moved to IIT Delhi. And for my postdoc, I moved to NIH. So uh, while navigating from one institute to another, the only key factor was that I was very curious. Like I have seen DU life. I have seen what it has to offer. Like uh, in D, when you are in DU, you uh, tend to have more of activities. Like, okay, the, the mainstream courses goes on, but in DU, you develop like, um, be it a communication skills or you're participating in some XYZ oh, activity. Yeah, overall personality development is quite higher in DU. And once I have seen DU, how it works, like how it operates, I was very curious how IIT system works because uh, when I like did my 12th exam, I never wrote JE. So my father was a bit disappointed about that, but I never wanted to be an engineer. So um, when I was in DU, because it provides you a better exposure, better information. So I got to know that there is a IIT jam examination. In my family, there was no academic person. So whatever information I got it, it is from that institute. So I got to know that, okay, there is an exam called IIT jam. And through if you clear it, you can get into IITs. So I wrote it and with the, like in my first attempt, I cleared it, got IIT Rudki. So IIT Rudki, it was totally different from the U system. It is a very closed campus. And then uh, research wise, it is quite on the higher side and international exposures are quite high in IITs. So uh, the first abroad international exposure I got is through Taiwan International Graduate Fellowship, which is of two month internship. You are completely paid, fully sponsored. So within the first year when I was there, I got this fellowship, get exposure to the outer world. I went to Academia Seneca. It is uh, working on cancer research. So as a very like very starter, I just started like how a research lab actually looks like. I was working with Professor Wen Shan Lee and we were working on fluorescent probes that can detect early cancer signs. So it was fantastic exposure. I came back, I made up a mind that I want to pursue this research field. Uh, though in India, it is a bit like off track field, especially from my region, because people are very curious about UPSC and parents usually think if you are good in academics, you can write some government exam and get uh, the job. So I convinced my parents that I want to pursue my PhD and then they said, okay, but like, it is harder to convince them, but I convinced them somehow. And then uh, I've always wanted to move abroad for my PhD studies. But at that time, my father was suffering from cancer. And there are a lot of things that didn't turn well. And I was not very much mature enough that, uh, oh, you have to apply multiple, like I'll, I'll come to it. So you don't have to be very specific to one country, one fellowship. You have to have a very um, horizontal approach, broader approach. So that was a mistake which I did. And so I applied to only one institute because I was very confident that I'll get a fellowship, a PhD fellowship in abroad and I'll move because I've seen how IIT works. So fortunately, I have filled the IIT Delhi form, gave the interview, and then I joined a chemistry department, IIT Delhi under Professor Shivaji Ragula as a PhD student. So I started my journey as an organic synthetic chemist, but then COVID hit and the labs were shut down. Then I moved to like, I self-learned computational skills, I used my COVID time and then carried out some research based on that also. So I mentioned this because intentionally because sometimes it is a need of the time to up, keep on upgrading your skills. You cannot just sit and waste your time. So whatever is coming on your table, just use the opportunity to upgrade your skills because Nowadays, even the research are very interdisciplinary trans, uh, in translational nature. So you have to have an idea of like how biologists think, how chemists think, how chem informatics thinks, and how computational things. And you can integrate those. At least you can uh, interpret the results and include in your studies. So this has helped me in fetching NIH 
fellowship. So, um, okay. So coming to how I landed to NIH and what NIH has to offer. So I told you like IIT systems are very different from DU and they'll give you a better international exposure. This is like my um, opinion. And then when I uh, was applying, searching for postdoc positions, I started very early, like before even synopsis, because I knew that it will take time. Whatever mistakes I have to uh, commit on, say, writing a mail or whatever, I'll like I have sufficient window to do that. It is not that I have submitted my PhD, had my defense, and then I'm starting searching the fellowship. It is like, it is a kind of a blunder to me because it will then take another six months or say a year to fetch a decent good postdoctoral fellowship. So I started early uh, and um, mentioning that, you know, social media works. So I found this fellowship on Twitter, like some of the uh, guy has posted it. And then I applied formally, not just by commenting, I'm interested. No, it won't work. Like I have seen some uh, colleagues and juniors doing that. Like if a professor is uh, advertising any postdoctoral or research associate position, some of the people just mentioned that I'm interested and I don't know whether they are following up it, it up or not. But the right way is rather than commenting or rather than just go to the uh, website if and we then- just briefly stop you. You know, yeah. it shows that you are not very serious if you're just commenting and leaving it. In case sure, sure. Uh, when you are preparing a full application and responding uh, with uh, a proper application, it shows your seriousness. So that makes a difference. Yes, sir. Rightly said, because you have to write a proper mail attaching all your documents, be it cover letter, be it CV, be it a motivational letter sometimes, and be it a research statement, like what research you have done, how effective it was, it can be a one page summary. So you have to provide a, a professor sufficient document that he can review, like what sort of background he have, you have to, because you are applying and you want that position. So it is your duty to provide a professor or recruiter ample amount of information and highlighting what you can bring to their table. Once again, if I go to stop, you know, viewers, it is very important because there would be many fellows across the world who would be applying for the same position. So your first, they say love is love you make in the first impression. So the moment the fellow sees your application, if it is complete, the fellow could understand how much keen you are and your level of excitement is as much as that of a professor. So there is a huge chances of matching. So I think this is a very serious advice. Please uh, follow it. Sure, sir. Adding on to this, I will also want to add that uh, don't write very generic mails. You have to be very specific and tailor your mail depending on the labs. Like, okay, you are really interested into this kind of a research. What has drawn you to that lab? What research? and paper you have read you can quote it or like you you cannot just write um, what I call is whatsapp message oh I'm interested in this and that it won't work because I have seen my senior saying that they have wrote 150 200 300 mails sir I have never done that I think because message, yes, is very, message is very clear you need to be specific some people hmm. commit a mistake that they create a standard biodata and send it yeah. just like that please don't do that you need to reorient your biodata as per the requirement of the project where you are going to apply. So please do that. And also I would recommend that these days, a lot of research social media is there, like Google Scholar, Orsid, uh, ResearchGate, uh, et cetera, et cetera, where you may read profile of the person where you are going to apply so that you become more and more specific to the demands or to the needs of that fellow and uh, justify your inclusion. Thank you, Anu. It was very really useful. Uh, since we are running out of time, I would like to just touch one more point. You know, this is the admission time in India. And a lot of uh, people, young people, are struggling to qualify examinations. You have been one of those rare gems who have qualified NET, GATE, JAM. And uh, what mantra you would like to give to those who are preparing for these examinations? And for each one of these three examinations, what would be your strategy? Please share. 
that I think uh, keeping it very short, since you mentioned that we are running out of time, one is like understand the exam pattern. That is very important. Most of the people don't understand that, that it is very crucial to understand what the exam demands. Gate is different from net and so forth. So you have to understand the exam and then uh, please be very dedicated if you really wanted to crack it. Like they are not very fancy exams. They are not um, like... You can do it in your first attempt if you're a serious candidate. I have seen people giving it multiple attempts, still not doing it because you have, they are not quite serious about it. Understand the exam, practice questions, and be it like, because in my time, jam was subjective as well as objective. So whatever exam you are giving, it is objective. So you have to practice that question and you have to handle that three hours. I have seen people preparing, they know very well, but they cannot handle that exam pressure. So it is very important that before exam, say one month before, just practice exam, whatever you have done it. Or And then uh, lastly, I'll say that uh, prepare dedicatedly, like prepare dedicatedly exam pattern, you should understand and your concept should be very clear, like the subject concepts, it is mugging up won't help, like you have to understand the concept because they are prepared by IIT professors and you know, so the questions will be like, they'll be checking your concept clarity. So sometimes people don't understand the concept and they'll go with the short tricks or, you know, very surface knowledge. Sometimes it won't help. So it is better to have that clarity, like, okay, you're giving that exam, concept clarity should be there. Last point I would like to discuss with you is, you know, how much overseas participation of our researchers help, especially when they are among the peer group? For example, Lindo meeting or several such things. Oh, said that Lindau meeting is one of the best experience I had so far because it was not just a conference. It was a meeting that you are meeting Nobel laureates. You are eating with them, sitting with them because you will be having science walk, dinners, and it will be have ample amount of time to have one on one interaction. So such meetings or conferences will help you grow individually you will uh, your you know uh, ideas grows you grow uh, uh, in a sense that you understand cross culture ideas not just in science but you accept uh, you become more tolerant towards culture and cuisine and all other things so it's, it it will uh, lead to a holistic development you get to know what like other people are approaching towards what new things are coming in the world so uh, it will help you grow not just academically but personally also. So if you are getting a chance, you should. Yeah, I think complete. India these yeah, days yeah. offered a lot of opportunities. For example, Linda Nobel laureate meeting is one. BRICS Young Scientist or Shanghai Cooperation Young Scientist meeting is there. Then we are having Asian Science Camp. We are having uh, uh, in Japan uh, this uh, event where a lot of science luminaries are coming. There are a lot of opportunities for our youngsters. And what Dr. Anu said that they provide you not only science, but a cross-culture opportunity. You know, you learn what people in your age group in other countries are doing. You learn what the scientific leaders are doing and how they are doing. So it helps you in overall development. Thank you, Anu. It was nice talking. So can I add one more line? Like if you want to uh, stay uh, updated with the fellowships of the program, you must follow Sir's page, uh, LinkedIn page, because he completely posts whatever fellowships is coming and, you know, you'll be very updated. So sometimes I have seen juniors, like they get to know something, say the deadlines is over. And so you must uh, follow some of the crucial pages so that you'll be aware of what's happening around you and what are the opportunities lying. So thank that you. is the one. Thank you for that. And thank you, yeah. viewers. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Bye for now. Goodbye. Thanks.